It's the biggest risk for 2022. And in today's show, we're going to look at what the biggest risk for stocks, bonds, and the economy in the new year. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today as investors are bold up like crazy as they ring in the new year, looking forward to another year of potentially outsized returns. But is the bond market already telling them the party's coming to an end? Well, let's take a look at what's coming for stocks, bonds, and the economy Let's kick this off with buybacks, probably the number one thing investors are keyed on, are poised for a record year, but who do they help? Ask CNBC, and here we can see buybacks are surging after creating in the first half of 2020, obviously due to the pandemic. Buybacks have increased six quarters in a row and are poised for a record year, and this is huge at nearly $850 billion total buyback volume for 2021 would exceed a record $806 billion seen in 2018. And fueling the surge are financials and tech stocks as the bulk of buybacks are concentrated in a small group of companies. And the top five accounted for almost 30% of the buybacks in the third quarter, four of the five being technology companies. As we can see, Apple, Meta, or Facebook, Alphabet, or Google, Bank of America, and Oracle leading the pack. And why are buybacks concentrated in tech companies? Well, everybody thinks the Fed can print money. Now, these, these tech companies, they're the real ones that are printing money. But the issue facing stocks is something called market breadth or over-concentration in a small number of stocks. And let's take a look at what we see in the S&P 500. If you look at the top holdings, you've got Apple and Alphabet and Meta or Facebook leading that. And even in QQQ, of course, the NASDAQ 100, you've got Apple and you've got Microsoft. You've got big companies who's also buying a stock back. And so what you're seeing is an over-concentration. Here you can see just in the NASDAQ 100, almost 12% of it's Apple stock alone. And from a breath standpoint, what you see is when the number of stocks in, in major indices, such as the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ 100, starts to slow and you start to see stocks give back some of their rally while a smaller number of them continue to lead. Well, it tells you bad things are coming. doesn't mean the rally can't continue, but it means the party's coming to an end. And here we see Going back to 2007, something called market breadth that looks at the percentage of S&P 500 stocks above their 200-day moving average. And here you can see that percentage as a decline going into the great financial crisis. Stocks initially rallied, and then they gave that back up. And we could see coming into 2014, they started to give that up. Stocks did keep rallying, no problem. But as it finally, the percentage of stocks above their 200-day moving average gave back, well, the market went flat for almost three years with no gains. And here we see it coming again. We saw it, of course, in 2018, we had that problem. We saw it going into the pandemic. And now look, breath is weakening. Of course, with an over-concentration of small number of stocks, it means that eventually that party of, for the equity market is coming down. And we see the same thing in the NASDAQ 100, looking at the percentage of stocks over their 200-day moving average. The breath, just like the S&P 500, is heading lower. And again, that is a huge risk to stocks. And the, But the question is, can these buybacks matter? Do they actually help investors? Can they drive the equity market? Of course, CNBC asking this, rightfully so. The buybacks do not also reduce their share count, do not benefit investors because it is reduced share count that improves the earnings per share, which is what investors want. But many companies announce buyback even as they give out new options to executives and other employees, which does not reduce the share count. Those executives and employees are exercising those options. They're just cashing them in. It's like draining a swimming pool, buying back stock, and filling it up at the same time with a hose, creating new stock through options. And here we can see that it's often washed. In fact, the total share count for the S&P 500 is slightly higher today than it was in 2018. So that whole notion that share buybacks can drive the equity market, well, it's not working. In fact, let's continue on with the story because there's an additional reason buybacks are not generating share count reductions despite record amounts of money spent. Buybacks are executed in dollars, not shares bought back. And But the S&P 500 is up almost 50% since the end of 2019. So quote, the impact on share count remains significantly lower compared to previous years as higher stock prices have reduced the number of shares companies 
can buy back with their current expenditures, according to Howard Silverblatt, who tracks buybacks as senior index analyst for S&P Dow Jones Indices, said in a recent note to his clients. The bottom line, according to Silverblatt, share count has increased despite the fact that over $2 trillion has been spent on buybacks since the end of 2018. And that is a big problem because as price goes up, they can't buy as much back. Now, if, if the buybacks were increasing by 50% in terms of dollar amount, that would be different, but they're not. And so as buybacks stagnate and we see share count not being reduced, it's a huge risk to equities. But is that what's really been driving the equity market? Well, I don't think so. I think it has much more to do with fiscal stimulus and that too has come to an end. And here we can see the monthly child tax credit payments have ended. Here's why lawmakers face hurdles to add more. According to CNBC, as the Build Back Better bill stalls, the SODU plans to add more monthly child tax credit payments. And last checks were sent in December, actually on the 15th, and could be the last if Congress doesn't act. And of course, we've talked about the political risk for the Build Back Better plan, because the longer it goes without being passed, the fewer people in Congress are likely to support it, potentially with especially since the midterms are coming in November but check this chart out this is the S&P 500 and here you can see the the those checks went out right here see this green bar that was the 15 three days later the markets goes down and shoots up it's almost as if when those checks were deposited people turn around and bought stocks with them and now we see the end of fiscal stimulus and that perhaps has been the biggest driver of equities is people take money they don't need and speculate on stocks and now it's all over over. And what that created was this huge amount of margin debt, a record amount of margin debt is not only investors took or consumers took their stimulus checks and reinvested them in equities, they borrowed against them and bought even more. Now, if you remember, if you're, if you're, if you don't understand what we're talking about here, remember back during the, before the great financial crisis, people would buy a home. It would appreciate in value. They would strip the equity out of it and use the equity to leverage and buy more property. So they use it as a down payment. And when that home went up in value, they strip the equity and go buy more. And that's what investors are doing with their stocks. When you see this chart, that red part is the amount of margin debt or money borrowed against equities. It's a record all-time high, and it is highly correlated with this advance in stocks. So without fiscal stimulus to keep propelling consumers to buy stocks and borrowing on margin, the question becomes, as a big risk, when they have to start paying that interest cost, if stocks don't go higher, what happens when they're forced to get unwind that when they get margin call or worst case if actually something hits the economy and drives stock prices lower they become forced sellers now one thing you don't need to worry about from that perspective is your portfolio because check out portfolio shield and make it part of your new year's plans and let's look at the economy because it's facing risk and for stock investors it's not something they want. Let's continue on here as we see that the U.S. goods trade deficit hits a record in November. Now that means that we imported a record amount compared to what we exported. And the trade's good deficit widened last month by 17.5% to $97.8 billion from $83.2 billion in October, the Commerce Department said on Wednesday. That exceeds the previous record set in September at $97 billion. Exports, which is not good for our growth, declined by 2.1%, while imports rose by 47 And trade has been a drag, and this is brilliant. Thank you, CNBC, for saying this. On gross domestic product growth for five straight years, while inventories add to the output in the third quarter. So what you see, there's two issues here that I, we're going to look at a chart is the one that when you import more than you export, it brings GDP down, which I'll show you in a second. And then the second issue is you have all these imports potentially adding to inventories. And I know you're thinking, but I keep hearing about the inventory shorts. Hang tight because this is a big risk for the economy. And check this out. Here you can see the trade balance as it heads lower. Well, it has a very nice correlation, particularly since the great financial crisis, suggesting that as we import more than we export, and then for some reason, reason the Fred database did not have the most recent uh, print on there that GDP growth is headed lower bad news for the economy and of course are we going to see even more imports and the answer is yes here's a chart from UBS showing the backlog of container ships waiting to enter the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles and you can see we're not quite at record high but we're near there and they're looking inside of course the range and then outside because remember if you don't or don't know the California said look you can't park your ships off the coast you got to move them out farther away and so they did 
And what we see is a huge amount of goods looking to come into the country, and that is going to mean less growth for GDP and for our country. And it also is going to have an issue with consumer prices because when we import, we import deflation or disinflation. But let's keep going because check this out. U.S. business inventories increased strongly in October. And there are concerns from some economists that businesses wary of delays getting stock could overorder. Right. And that makes sense because if you don't know where your stuff's coming from, you order from multiple places, hoping that one shows up and then you cancel your other orders and end up with excess inventory, which could put ec the economic expansion in jeopardy. And here we have wholesale inventories. And you can see on a month over month basis, higher, 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 higher. In fact, if you're looking at this and say, wait a minute, I thought there was a, a shortage in goods. Well, there is a shortage in some goods. But in others, inventory is backing up and expected to get worse as you see all those container ships. And when you see the risks of the economy now, how that then translates to the manufacturing sector is if you have too much ordering going on and you have too much inventory sitting around, well, what does that mean? That people are eventually going to stop ordering and that's going to cut to manufacturing production. And here we can see that the U.S. regional Fed survey models, then these come out every month against the quote unquote official ISM manufacturing index, according to the Fed models, and this is brilliant, that that means manufacturing sector is going to stall out. The growth in that is going to flatten out. And historically, equities tend to follow the ISM to the downside. So it's a huge risk to the market. Let's keep going on because the other rest issue to, for the economy is real disposable personal income, and it is currently at zero. So consumers are neither any better nor any worse than they were a year ago, but prices have risen, and that means consumers are not going to be able to consume at the rate they did before because they don't have the fiscal stimulus padding their pockets to go out and spend. So you look at these risks to the economy, and they're huge. And then we look at inflation because everyone's fixated on that and its effect on the economy. And what we can see from an inflation standpoint is it's really a story of crude oil and energy prices. And then when energy prices come down, well, so too does inflation. In fact, when we see these big peaks in inflation, usually you have following that three years of disinflation. And you want to talk about potentially bond bullish, well, that's it. And sometimes, as we got in the great financial crisis, you get outright deflation. And with all the inventories building up and all the ships sitting off to at least California, the risks of that increase. Of course, we look at the bond market, who's had one of its worst years on record, but maybe perhaps poised to have a big year. But not only that, it's telling us what's going on perhaps with the equity market and why that party in stocks is coming to end. Let's first start with the two-year treasury note, and it's going up a little bit. Now you say, well, why does that matter? Well, it's real simple because what bonds tell us is growth and inflation expectations. It tells us over a range. So when you get close in the front end in the two-year, it tells you that it's just validating there's still growth and inflation happening right now. And what you want to look for is where that starts to peak out. But the long bond is if looking out, you're putting the binoculars on and looking way out in the future, the long bond has said, look, growth and inflation expectations peaked back in March and have been heading lower, and in fact, are likely to head a whole lot lower. And that is an issue because in the short term, we see growth and inflation, but over the long term, the, the, the bond market is telling you, look, this isn't happening. And I want you to understand that there is a really good relationship between treasury yields, particularly on the long end, and equity prices. When you see this, you'll understand why stock prices are very much likely to head lower. And this is a story of, of growth expectations, right? Because stocks go up and people think, okay, stocks are rising, growth is coming. And But bonds, treasury, especially on the long end of the curve out there, the 30s are a much better proxy for growth. And so you should see that if growth is coming on the horizon, they both should rise together. And if it's not, they should fall together. So let's take a look at this and we'll go back to the 1990s and late 90s, you see in blue, 30 year treasury yields and the Wilshire 5,000 in red, and you see them rising together and yields all peak and then they start coming out. So they're saying, look, growth expectations have peaked and stocks kept going and yields started to head lower. Stocks stayed high and yields led equity prices lower. And you can see when they're moving in tandem, they're coming out of the recession, growth expectations rising, and they both went down together. Let's go to the next set. Here we come in the great financial crisis. And what do we see? Yields peak ahead of the equity market. The equity market peaks months later. 
In fact, not in fact, the following year. And as yields go down, it's telling you that, hey, growth expectations for the future are headed lower. And eventually stocks came with it. And today people tell you that now nah, it doesn't work that way. The low interest rates are fuel for equities. Well, now they don't get it because when you have a rally in stocks and you see yields peak and head lower, what, is, what the bond market is telling you is that future growth expectations are going to be a lot less than everyone thinks. And the stock market's got it wrong. And that's why you see what this looks like jaws, like alligator jaws that close. So either interest rates need to go up to validate the equity market's growth expectations or stock prices need to come down when the bond market, who is a sayer of truth here, validates that the growth expectations everyone thinks are coming, they're actually not coming at all. But everyone still is worried about the end of QE, and this means definitely higher interest rates are coming. But as my friend Jeff Snyder has often said, that QE doesn't really do anything. Well, it does actually do some things, but maybe it doesn't matter is what he's saying. Maybe somebody would buy these bonds regardless of whether QE is happening or not. And actually the truth is somebody would and it's the banks. And let me show you why. Because here you can see deposits in banks in blue and loans and leases in red. And there was nearly a one-to-one -one correlation of this right until something interesting happened. It's called the Great Financial Crisis. And after that, deposits continued to rise and loans and leases, well, relatively stagnated. And when you take the loans and leases and divided by deposits, you get the, something called the loan to deposit ratio. And notably, you overlay 10 year treasury yields and it tells you that for some reason, treasury yields follow this, it should head lower. Now, if you're wondering how it is that could be, well, let me connect the dots for you because when you don't have enough loans to match all your deposits, you still have to pay your depositors interest. So what do the banks have to do with those deposits to get interest to pay them pay them back. They take those deposits that we discussed and they convert them into bank reserves by buying treasury securities. And when they use the interest off those treasury securities to pay the depositors. And so when you take that chart that we I just showed you a moment ago and you take deposits and then you take loans and leases in red and add the securities and bank credit, aha, uh -huh, you get a whole different picture. And in fact, it shows that banks have often held more assets, loans being and leases being an asset, and a treasury security being an asset, a deposit being a liability. They've often held more assets and liabilities, except right now they're not. And so what does that tell you is that banks need to and will continue to buy bonds. And so even as we see a taper coming, which is generally bearish or bullish for the bond market, well, it tells us the banks aren't going to stop buying anytime soon. So perhaps that QE doesn't even matter. The fact that the Fed is tapering may not matter. But what do we see back in 2013 when the Fed announced it in the middle of it, yields went up a little bit, perhaps like we saw now. And then went on a ripper to the downside. And we look at TLT, one of the, the largest traded uh, ETF for the long bond. And between that and the peak went up about 36% compared to the S&P 500, that only went about 18% of that time. So what you're seeing is the biggest risk for stocks right now is that bonds are going to massively outperform. And a lot of people, in fact, nearly everybody's betting against this. Fund managers have a very small allocation to bonds. If in fact we look at investors across the board, they have one of the smallest allocation to bonds in the history of investing, perhaps maybe even the lowest amount. And speculators who are super short the bond market, in fact, I went back and I don't have a chart showing back to 2013 that I could show you, um, but they weren't, speculators weren't even as short as they are now. So everybody is betting that interest rates are going higher when the real risk is interest rates are going lower because the growth and expectation or inflation expectations are going to go away as inflation heads lower due to weak a, a weakening economy without the juice from fiscal transfers. So now you see the biggest risks to the stock market. Well, it's just too much leverage. The biggest risk for the economy is too much ordering and too big of inventories. The big risk for inflation is lower crude oil prices. And the biggest risk for bonds, well, the investors are going to be wrong and they're going to go up in value. And so with that, thank you for being fans. Thank you for sharing this last year for me with me. And I look forward to seeing you in the new year. I'm Steve Ann Meter. Thanks for watching.
Buy now. The content of this video is provided as educational information only. It's not intended to provide investment or advice. The materials are to be construed as a solicitation or rec recommendation or solicitation by a security financial instrument or to participate in any particular trading strategy. This video was paired by Steve Van Meter in personal capacity. Pins expressed this video that do not effectively valid financial advice, Inc. or Steve Van Meter Financial.